Uh, welcome to today's program presented in partnership with the Department of Cultural Affairs from the City of Los Angeles. We will be discussing our Big Read selection, Advice from the Lights, with author and poet Stephanie Burke. For those interested, this book is available to check out online via our All Overdrive platform. The Big Read program is a program of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with Arts Midwest. First, I'd like to introduce myself. I'd like to introduce myself and my colleague Edwin Rodarte. Um, we are two of the chairs for the Los Angeles Public Library's LGBTQIA Services Committee, and we've been serving. Oh, probably the best second reading I've ever done. What just happened? I'm not sure. Right. Think not sure. Like maybe an ad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're gone now. Uh, so um, Edwin and I serve on the library's. Um, Big Read Committee, and we're the two chairs of the LGBTQIA Services Committee. Uh, our guest today is poet, literary critic, and professor Stephanie Burt. Burt grew up around the Washington, D.C. area and received an AB from Harvard in 1994 and a PhD in English from Yale in 2000. She taught at Mal McAllister College for several McAllister. years. McAllister. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> A little nervous. Uh, for several years before becoming a professor of English at Harvard University. She has, has written several books, including two critical books on poetry and four poetry collections. And she is responsible for coining the terms elliptical poetry and the new thing as new categories of contemporary poetry. Uh, in 2012, the New York Times called for one of the most influential poetry critics of her generation. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times Book Review, the London Review of Books, the Times Literary Supplement, The Believer, and the Boston Review. We are thrilled to welcome her today to discuss her fourth full-length collection of poetry, Advice from the Lights. Welcome, Stephanie, and thank you for joining us. I am happy to be here. We're happy to have you. Um, would you like to do a reading of a poem? Yeah, we can absolutely start with a reading. And um, there is a whole bunch of, of new work, which I can talk about if we want to get to it. But since the big read selection is this book, uh, I thought we should maybe start with that. I haven't read this one aloud for a while, so let's start with this one from the middle of the book. My 1983. When I told Marina I liked her new striped tunic, but there was a hole in her armpit, under her sleeve, I thought I was making a generous, helpful gesture, an appropriate social move. That was the year when we studied the Great Depression, the business cycle, and macroeconomics. Companies grew by meeting familiar demands or else by spreading news about new pleasures. I wanted programmable gloves that could make you bionic whose workings I laid out in series, in graph paper pictures. I diagrammed volts and resistors, tongue and groove, the difference between graphic novels and newspaper comics. Also a parallelogram based function for love. I gave a whole series of 10 minute lunchtime lectures about linguistics to playground structures. Steve, my favorite teacher told me, you'll probably use those theories someday and your future colleagues will thank you for all of them, but we'd like to think about what might be interesting to your friends, not just what's interesting to you. And since that is a uh, poem about failing at childhood, uh, which is a very common uh, trans girl experience, um, I feel like I should, should find a poem about not failing at uh, being a teenager or maybe not failing at uh, adulthood. Um, hmm. Here's a good one for the moment we're in, I hope. Advice for holding together. Here is a shoelace, tougher than snakeskin, coarser than coat's wool. Under each spiral, a union of polymers, structurally analogous 
to the transatlantic cable, to the supposed progress of civilization, to anything else you can worry between thumb and ring held together so that it can work at all by the aglet at each end. What you can't hear may be deafening somebody else. What's almost too small to see may just be far away. Be your own means of magnification or microscopy. Become your own indignity. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so as we were discussing before we started, it's National Library Week. Um, so we, would, we were hoping if you wouldn't mind sharing a memory of a library or a librarian that maybe made an impression on you. Oh, sure. I'm pretty sure that my first encounter with poetry that was uh, older than the 20th century was in a grade school library project in third or fourth grade, I think third grade, uh, in which the project was to copy out by hand and make kind of a display of some poem that we found in the school library somewhere. Uh, and I ended up doing a fairly flowery cursive copy of the beginning of John Milton's Lycidas. Uh, a poem from the middle of the 17th century that's a little bit daunting if you're not already used to reading poems from that time, but that's endlessly fascinating if you sort of let yourself get into it. Some people have heard the beginning, yet once more ye, ye, uh, yet once more ye laurels, right? And once more ye ivy seer. I come to pluck your berries harsh and rude, harsh and crude, sorry, and with forced fingers rude. Oh, that's terrible. Um, I've missed a verb before the mellowing year. Now I'm gonna to have to find the whole beginning of it because this is the sort of thing that it's my job to be able to do. Uh, I am terrible. No. It's... Anyway, uh, I memorized the beginning of it at that time, shatter your leaves. And that remind, now I know why I wasn't remembering the verb correctly. Yet once more ye laurels and once more ye myrtles brown with ivy never sear, I come to pluck your berries harsh and crude and with forced fingers rude, shatter your leaves before the mellowing year. And it's an elegy and it turns out to be a way in where Milton by mourning his sort of college friend in pastoral guise can think about uh, what it means for him to want to write poetry that will be remembered and uh, what it means to live under a regime that's not doing its basic job and not really legitimate anymore. Uh, and also he gets to think about Christianity, which he liked thinking about. Um, but that was sort of how I learned what poetry was through a project in a grade school library. That's great. That's awesome. That's great to hear. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'll introduce myself too. My name is Edwin Rodarte. Uh, thank you for, for, for being here as well. Um, I'm going to ask you a little bit more about the book. Um, sure. Can you tell us why did you name the book Advice from the Lights? So that's sort of mysterious. Um, I spent a while trying to figure out what the heck this book was going to be called. And I had a fragment lying around that I wasn't sure was a finished poem that was also called Advice from the Lights. And I realized that this was the right title. And it's supposed to be kind of a sad title. I think honestly, all of my, all the books of poetry that I've published so far have titles that are sort of sad and ironic, even though it's not especially a sad book. Uh, advice from the Lights is advice that you may not want to take. It's advice that may be outdated if it comes from the stars. It may be unreliable because it's astrological. Uh, which is not a thing I believe in, although it's useful to many. It may be advice from uh, an ignis fatuus, from a swamp light, that if you follow it, you'll get lost or you'll get in trouble. Uh, and it may be advice for people who are in kinds of darkness that I haven't experienced or kinds of dilemmas I haven't experienced, uh, compared to whom uh, I'm in a position of, of privilege. Um, I, we all have our struggles, otherwise we wouldn't be reading literature, uh, but I'm quite conscious, I hope, that I'm in and have usually been in positions of, of privilege, including white privilege, and uh, largely sort of positional and institutional privilege. And there's something a little 
odd about wanting to write a poetry that contains helpful wisdom and helpful models for other people when I'm already in this position of comfort and privilege. Maybe the poems contain advice that's coming from a distant and unreliable place. But then maybe the poems contain advice that you can take that will brighten your day. So I wanted all of those resonances in there. Yeah, I think that's a, like a perfect title. It's, it's so many different Thank names, different albums. Thank you. I'm glad you like it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, along those lines, how much of the book um, was autobiographical? So the book has several different slices in it that interweave rather than being distributed. One of the slices appeared as a chapbook from the wonderful people in at uh, Rain Taxi in Minneapolis. And that was a chapbook called All Season Stephanie. And all of the poems with Stephanie in the title are from that series. And those are not directly autobiographical. They're poems about the girlhood that I did not get to have because at the time people thought it was a boy, which was wrong, but I didn't tell people, so they didn't know. Um, and so those are counterfactual autobiography. There is another series of poems, most but not all of which have my plus a year in the title that are largely autobiographical. Most of those things really happened. Names and details have been changed, but those are based on the actual childhood and teen years that I had for, for better and worse. Uh, and then there are other strands of the book. There are a lot of talking objects and insects and ferrets and uh, you know sexy flashlights and you know blocks of ice. And those experiences are you know true to feeling. I hope, but I'm not you know literally uh, a, a ferret or a water strider. And yet, in some ways, those are the most personal poems in the book. And then there are also, there's, trend, there's fake translations or imitations from the ancient Greek, which sort of blew up into the most recent book, which is all translations and imitations. Um, and those contain autobiographical elements too, but they are heavily, heavily mediated. Okay, oh, that's fascinating. I can't wait to read it. Oh, we'll get you one. It's just after Columbicus, which is the new book, um, is out this month. We're doing remote Oh, it's fading, it's fading. Uh, here we go, we're doing remote, you now everybody's fading. There it is. Publicity for it. Um, and that, that book is from Princeton University Press. Uh, I certainly hope uh, to do more with Grey Wolf. Grey Wolf has been amazing. Uh, and I still you know, think of them as the people who publish my poetry, but Princeton does a series that's specifically for translations mm -hmm. and asked for after Callimachus. And I'm very happy to work with them on that one. Great. So I guess uh, this kind of ties in a little bit, but as a poet, how do you decide that a collection of poems is just ready? Like what process do you go through to organize the poems into a collection? Oh, wow. I don't even know. Uh, <laughs> I, I print them all out and throw them on the floor and then stack them up and read through the stack. And then I do it again and again and again until it seems like it's got three to five segments that are of roughly comparable size. And there's an arc so that if you read the collection straight through, which I think most people don't, you'll end up in a more profound and I hope happier, though that's not always the case, place from the place you began. Um, and I try to see whether it seems, you know, unified enough and thick enough and, you know, good enough. Um, and then, you know, what's been happening lately is, is when it's a collection, a full length collection of poems by me, uh, I send it to the absolutely wonderful Jeff Schatz at Grey Wolf and hope that he agrees. And I send it to a couple of friends who usually read these things while they're in, in process before I send it to, to, to Jeff. Uh, but I show it to friends who read it and then I send it off and see whether they think it's a collection. And I really do try to take advice. I don't always take advice, of course, uh, but I don't, 
I, and if anything, I might be too ready to take advice at some points, but I do like to think of my writing as deeply collaborative. And at the level of, of the book, uh, it's very collaborative. I, I don't trust myself to know when a book is finished. I trust myself to have a hypothesis that there's a finished book. And then I test the hypothesis by showing it to people I trust. For, um, for this collection of poetry, what was there a, cho a reason you chose to have five different sections and how did you decide which poems would belong in each? Yeah, so the f I didn't set out to have five sections. Um, I did set out to have, I knew that I was writing multiple series and that I wanted to interleave them rather than splitting them up as so it felt like five chapbooks. And I knew that I wanted to start with the poems, start mostly with the poems whose implied you know, agents or speakers were the youngest and end with the poems whose speakers could conceivably be adults. And I wanted a poem that was kind of an overview that, that dealt with my somewhat public life at the beginning. And I'd already written one. It's the one with the talking block of ice. And then this book was, already had a place on the Great Wolf publication calendar. And I, we were already sort of waiting to see when it was finished, uh, when uh, the you know, orange guy uh, got into the White House. And that was rather disturbing. And I wrote a set of poems that were mostly short-lined uh, about how we might all deal with uh, living in a failed state and not lose hope and look beyond the rhetoric of resistance and revolution to a rhetoric of local and regional community building. And those went into the last section because they were, whatever that means, more adult poems. Uh, but those, those were all late editions. I'm pretty happy with how, how they turned out. Yeah, no, it was wonderful. We, in a lot of our book club discussions, we commented a lot on the progression. So that's where the question came from is trying to figure yeah, out yeah. what you were thinking and how you decided to put them in this. Yeah, this way. yeah, yeah. And the other thing about the order of that book that some people have noticed is that it's as, as you, you know, may have noticed it's a coming out book. Um, it's a book about telling the world that you're trans. Uh, and it's a book whose series of personae, whether they are teens or, uh, you know, flashlights in a drawer, can't really imagine a satisfying adulthood, except as a matter of public life, right? Of, of caregiving for others and political participation is something that I'm trying to represent that adults can do. And that's something I tried to do in earlier books as well for what that's worth. Uh, but the sort of deep emotional lives of the people in, in, in that book, uh, they don't see a way to grow up. They don't see emotionally satisfying communities they can join as adults. And in, in retrospect, you know, of course not, because if you don't get to be fully emotionally yourself, you can have a lot of joy in the world and a lot of satisfaction as an adult. And you can be you know, happy as well as productive and useful and interesting. Um, but you're not gonna be able to represent yourself as deeply and securely linked to a whole community of others in, in the present if, if you can't be authentically yourself. And a lot of the poems that I've been working on that I hope will be in the next book, which isn't finished and doesn't have a title, um, are poems about finding queer and trans community. Um, poems about being able to make the kinds of durable and sort of viscerally and emotionally satisfying connections that the people in Advice from the Lights and you know, the insects and seagulls and other speakers in Advice from the Lights 
either never get or get, but no won't last or get, but at best it's in a sort of dyad and they can't move beyond that. Um, so I hope that the next book will also have a kind of progression and that it will be even more fun uh, and that it will be full of, of queer and trans joy. That's right. It was, it was fairly fun to go back and forth and try to make, you know, read specific lines of, uh, or collections of poetry together to see the progression of that story. So- um, Thank you. It, it, kind of, it always reminds me of the, the library books, like choose your own story. <laughs> you know, you, you began in one place and you, you try to find a progression of that story. Yeah, did you ever see Romeo and or Juliet? No, I don't believe I did. No. Okay, you know, the, you know the comic book character Squirrel Girl? Yeah. Yeah, so Ryan Norris, the writer who co-created the modern Squirrel Girl with Erica Henderson, also writes Choose Your Own Adventure Shakespeare stories. Mm. There's a book called Romeo and or Juliet, and that's what that is. And people awesome. Love it. I'll I haven't read that one yet, but I, I like Ryan North generally. He's, he's really fun. I'll definitely have to check it out. Then. Let's see. Um... In Advice from the Lights, uh, you refer to the concept of uh, persistence, resiliency, and the ability to bounce back uh, stronger and wiser. How are you feeling during this time of like isolation due to like COVID-19 uh, quarantines? And um, is this a com concept that could be ap applicable? Uh, how do we exercise persistence, literacy, uh, resiliency? Um, that's a, a large question. Um, I, I mean, I, don't, I, I, hope I'm not, I hope I'm not the first person people go to for persistence and resiliency, because I'm very lucky I haven't been through that much, right? Um, I'm, I'm a middle-aged white lady with an ultra-secure job. Uh, I'm not going to be laid off. Uh, my kids are wonderful. Our kids are wonderful. Uh, they are 10 and 14, which means that they can go and read a book or text with their friends or watch videos or play online Dungeons and Dragons, which I absolutely recommend and love. Um, and I know that they're not going to, uh, you know, try to eat the cats. Um, they're, they're so, and you know, I'm not a healthcare worker, right? I can work from home, I am working from home. This is working from home. Um, and I live in a state uh, that hasn't been badly mismanaged. The state of Massachusetts has been pretty hard hit, not as hard hit as New York or initially, uh, you know, Western Washington state, but Massachusetts knows what it's doing and local and state level government are pretty trustworthy. So I'm feeling kind of lucky. Uh, of course, I want to go hang out with my friends at their houses instead of being stuck at my house and, you know, go to the library and read library books in a library. Uh, but I'm, I guess, feeling lucky. And I think there's a certain amount of luck as well as endurance that's encoded in these poems and a certain amount of looking for joy and connection while acknowledging that everyone has their own struggles to go through. Um, their, their poems about outlasting various kinds of pain and isolation and about finding joy while you feel isolated, which is one of the things that the verbal arts, the literary arts are good for. So I suppose the poems might help people do that. Some of them really are manifestos about how to look past a terrible day or how to look past state failure. Um, and some of them are, I mean, most of them at some level are supposed to be fun. They're supposed to be fun to hear. Um, I, it sort of raises my hackles when I hear some readers and some critics say how much they love rhyme and how much they love uh, the supposedly apolitical play of language because you can make anything political if you want to. Um, and a lot of the poetry that I enjoy is very, very challenging and just weird and sometimes alienating. Uh, but I am trying in my own work to be playful 
and to have fun with language. And, and there's a lot of rhyme. Sometimes I'm surprised by how few poets of my generation in the US really use rhyme in a sustained way. Some do, of course. I mean, Terrence Hayes does. Terrence Hayes is probably my, certainly my favorite poet of my generation, although it's very strange to think of Terrence Hayes with his raft of accomplishments as my generation, but we're almost exactly the same age. Um, so it's not like I'm out there using rhyme the best. There are people who are way better at it, who are my age, who are also American. But I am using rhyme and I am using a lot of euphonies and I am trying to have fun with, with this work. And it's the kind of fun that you can have even when you can't leave your house. Yeah, well, and that definitely came across for us and all of our book club participants. We had a lot of fun reading it. Oh, thank you. That, thank you. That's one of the best things you could say. <laughs> The best thing you you definitely say. achieved being playful and wonderful with the language you use. Um, so as chairs for the LGBTQIA Services Committee, mm -hmm. family, we and thank you for doing that important work. Thank you. Uh, we typically look for programs and stories that impact our diverse communities. Can you talk more about being your authentic self and how poetry has assisted in that process or can assist others in that process as well? Oh yeah, absolutely. And there are a lot of ways. I thought that I was writing trans poetry from the time, from before I was publishing anything. Um, Cause you know, I knew I wanted to be a girl and didn't like being stuck in this body that was not legible as a girl body, right? Um, it turned out that other people didn't know that it was trans poetry until I came out for real. And then the you know, five or 10 or however many people who'd read the earlier poetry said, oh, and that still feels relatively recent, right? Like I was talking about being some flavor of trans as early as in public, as early as like 2011, 2012. Um, but I didn't tell everybody I was binary, that I was really a woman and start doing some medical stuff and you know, go and get a new driver's license and such until 2017. So it still feels kind of new. And it turns out that this book uh, and the sort of story of me that's in it apparently helps other people. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you know the term egg. Mm -mm. No. The term egg? Mm -mm. Um, and an egg is a trans person and especially a somewhat nerdy trans girl who has yet to come out to herself or to others. And uh, I, it's, it's probably not a term that you want to use if you're not trans, but it's a term that you, it's useful enough that I'm very happy to have cis people know it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, don't, I don't know how you identify at all, but I assume that we have some, the, the two of you, but I assume we have some cis people who are, you know, watching us or viewing us. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so yeah, it's not, if you're, if you're cisgender, which if you're new to these terms, which some people are, cisgender means not trans. It's like acoustic guitars or guitars that are not electric. Cisgender people are people whose genders are not transgender. Um, yeah, so I feel like some of these poems have helped some eggs hatch. Okay. And I hope that they are, are warm and comforting and help people feel seen. And I hope that a lot of the poems in this book in particular help people feel seen um, and feel, you know, it, it, to, in some measure understood at the same time as, as, they're, as they're fun to read. Um, there is a very familiar and over-familiar narrative about what it means to be trans that is true to some people's experience, but it's quite damaging if you think that's the only way to be trans. A narrative that says to be trans, to be someone who comes out as not the gender you were assigned at birth, you have to have been suicidally depressed, you have to have always known, you have to feel binary, all one thing and not the other. You have to be completely consistent and can't be fluid about how you feel from one day to the next. Uh, you have to you know, have lacked joy in your life before coming out. And none of those things have to be true. You know, I'm, I'm a lot happier and more fulfilled now 
Uh, but my life had a great deal of emotional satisfaction and, and joy and, and reward, uh, you know, before I transitioned. Um, I was dysphoric about my body because when you look in the mirror and you see something that's wrong, that's not a lot of fun. Uh, but I wasn't, you know, I've, I've never been so depressed. I couldn't get out of bed. Um, these are models I hope of, of trans joy and serious, but also, you know, fun ways to think about what it means to be a trans girl and to be a trans woman now. So I, I hope they, they help other people by being models and, and, and mirrors as well as, uh, I guess, windows representations. Does that answer your question or does it answer like another question? No, I think that's great. And it's yeah. definitely something that I, I know probably readers of that book or even uh, people that have uh, participated in our book clubs came across and you know it's it's great to know that those poems exist out there and that those that that reading exists as well. There are also poems that really don't want to be the only poems or the only models themselves. They're mm -hmm. they're full of allusions and pointers to other works of art by other people. Mm -hmm. um, I think at least some of them are poems that are conscious of their whiteness and my whiteness and the limits of whiteness. Um, I have noticed that poets of color are often asked to talk about their experiences as people who are Latinx or African-American or native or whatever the category is. Um, and I am sometimes asked about Jewish identity. I'm rarely asked about whiteness. I would like to see white poets bring up race and privilege and the fact that we still live in a white supremacist society. Uh, and I'd like to be able to have poems that acknowledge that. Um, and that also means poems that, that acknowledge the way their implied author is a member of some socially dominant or unmarked categories, as well as some socially visible and marked categories. And I don't know that Advice from the Lights does that consistently. It's certainly not the primary work that the poem's trying to do. But uh, saying, please don't let white stories be the only stories you hear is something that some of these poems I hope are doing. Thank you for including that narrative as well. Sure, <laughs> one tries, <laughs> one tries. Um, and the other, another kind of work that I guess the book is doing, one of the reasons I love writing poems in the voices of, you know, iguanas and pencil erasers and, you know, nail clippers and, uh, you know, stratocumulus clouds is that, and it's also a reason I, I really love fantasy and science fiction and to some extent, you know, superhero stories. Um, if you, if I'm, I'm writing from a perspective very much like mine, there are limits to how much I can see and how much I can say if I'm in a realist mode. But there are obvious problems, uh, I, certainly surmountable problems for some fiction writers, much more intractable problems if you're making lyric poetry. Um, if you're trying to write from a realistic perspective, from the perspective of a, per a person who could exist in our world now or recently, who's got a background very unlike yours. Um, but one doesn't want to write from the same perspective all the time anymore or then one wants to be confined to nonfiction or to realism all the time. And uh, if you write about what it's like to be a pencil eraser, you can tell a lot of emotional truths and you can do a lot of verbal experiments. You can get a lot of really serious emotions in there without having to be yourself. And uh, you will not be culturally appropriating a pencil eraser. Um, and and you know, the, same, the same is true if you write from the perspective of the uh, Andorians from Star Trek, the original series, who are blue and have little trumpet shaped horns, uh, which I've never done, but I might do. They're pretty interesting. Uh, they are non-human, uh, but they're close to human, but their poetry, which presumably exists is in Andorian and we don't read it. And it's not cultural appropriation to write from the perspective of the Andorian ambassador, although it could be hard. 
I think I have to rewatch a lot of uh, STTOS to do that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I mean, just in that, uh, some of those po poems were some of my favorite, to be honest. You know, some of the uh, the beta, the like the perspective of, of a kite flying. In. So it's uh, it's the inanimate objects in this other. Thank you so much. Yeah. So some of those some of those poems have really serious backstories. Mm -hmm. uh, the blue beta named Scarlet is real. Mm -hmm. uh, my friend Amanda's daughter, who was preschool age at the time, really did get a blue fish and name her Scarlet. And there really is a uh, King Triton and the Little Mermaid thing at the bottom of that aquarium where there was. <laughs> and the, the, minute, the minute that uh, I was told the name of Amanda's daughter's fish, uh, I realized that there absolutely had to be a, uh, a sonnet-like poem. That is a sonnet-like poem. In there. And also a Little Mermaid joke because no representation of modern trans identity is really complete without mermaids somewhere. Um, out of curiosity, I guess, uh, going, um, what are some of the of your current favorite poems or poets? And I think maybe you, you've mentioned one. Um, and what is it about their work that draws you to them? Different things for different poets. Mm -hmm. um, you ask for contemporary poets, for poets who are working now. Um, that can also give you a list of poets who've been dead for a while, whose work will endure, who I love. But in terms of people who are really mid-career poets who are, are poets writing now that you can go out and read a lot of. Uh, Terence Hayes is stunning. Um, and it's easy to find his most recent work, which is some of his best. Uh, the new book is called American Sonnets for a Past and Future Assassin. Um, Laura Kaszewski, whose name I'm gonna spell for you because it's hard to spell her name. K-A-S-I-S-C-H K-E, I feel very, very close to the work that she's doing, um, which often involves representations of uh, being a mom or uh, being a teenager or sometimes of uh, medical problems of, of illness and, and mourning and living in a time of, of illness. Um, I've written for some time about Ray Armentrout, who was San Diego based for many years. She, she's now in Washington state. Um, she writes very terse, sometimes very challenging poems that are very skeptical, that help people see through the, the BS of everyday life and try to see if there's anything more authentic underneath it. Um, those, are, those are American poets, there are many more. Uh, I'm a big fan of Carmen Jimenez Smith, who I work closely with at this point at The Nation. Um, her new book, which is called Be Recorder, is one of her, is, is, her, is her best book. Um, and that is also a coming out book in a very different register. Um, and it's it's very, very smart and also very accessible and very spontaneous feeling book. Um, it has a lot of big feelings. So Be Recorder by Carmen Jimenez Smith is, is a book that you want. Um, I still love the work of Paul Muldoon. I've been a fan of his since I was old enough to know who he was, I guess. Um, and he's a model for a lot of the fun, uh, over elaborate rhyming that I do. I like Robin Schiff, S-C-H-I-F-F. -F. Um, I like Angie Estes, who thinks a lot about beauty and intricate rhymes and intricate patterns and older beauty in, in the new world, E-S-T-E-S. -E um, there's a lot going on in New Zealand that I like right now. There's a very Instagram era kind of millennial friendly poet called Harold Lindsay Bird, who's got a lot of momentum, but there are older poets uh, who are generally much quieter poets, but who are very worth reading. Some of whom are mentioned and don't read poetry. Um, there's a poet called Jenny Bornholt from New Zealand who has no reputation over here, but she really should. She really should. Um, if you like Louise Glick, um, if you, or honestly, if you like Mary Oliver, um, who is much more populist than Jenny Bornholt, but if, if you want, or if you like, who's a better analogy, Jane Kenyon. I think Jenny Bornholt is, much, is a much better writer, a much more interesting writer than Jane Kenyon. Uh, don't please don't throw things at me, Jane Kenyon fans. I know she means a lot to a lot of people. Uh, but if you want to kind of get outside the borders of the, the US and you want someone you're going to be into if you're into Jane Kenyon, um, please read Jenny Bornholt and read Bernadette Hall, another writer whose reputation is entirely in New Zealand. She's great. Um, she's very interested in how to be feminist and Catholic at the same time and in representing Antarctica. She's a South Island poet. 
Um, Tai Tibble, T-I-B-B-L-E, is a poet who's interested in Maori and Pacifica heritage, um, who's a very, very celebrated emerging poet in New Zealand. I recommend that work. Um, Essa Ranapiri is a uh, Maori trans poet whose first book is getting a lot of attention there. Um, I'll stop with the New Zealand kick, uh, but I do try to keep up with New Zealand poetry. Um, and I would love to, I've been sort of yelling, Robert Minhinnick, who's Welsh, somebody else we ought to be reading here and we're not. Uh, Patience like Bobby, who's British Nigerian, who did an adaptation of the Canterbury Tales, uh, some of which is in British Nigerian English, very accessible. Uh, Patience like Bobby is somebody who's on high school syllabi, who is popular in Britain in almost the way that somebody like Robert Pinsky or maybe Rita Dove is popular in the US and has no traction over here yet, and I would like to fix that. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to have American readers read poetry written in English from outside the US. Uh, so before we take some questions from the audience, so if anybody wants to ask any questions, you're able to send them to us via the chat. We have someone monitoring and, and we'll be able to, to get those answered for you. Okay, uh, imagine a giant monitor lizard perched on a microphone. <laughs> That's exactly what we have. <laughs> oh, cool. Can I see? <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, while we wait for some of those to come in, our, our next question was, what are, your, what are you currently working on? Uh, but you spoke about that a little bit. Would you like to oh, yeah. hear something from the, the new collection or talk a little bit more about it? Oh, from After Callimachus? Yes. I would love to. Um, I, I don't want to scant uh, the, the big read book, Advice from the Lights, but we have talked about that for a while. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy with After Callimachus, which I never thought I'd write. People kind of came, people I trust very much came after me and said, you've been adapting Callimachus for most of the time you've been publishing poetry. Uh, why don't you do a whole book of these? And I said, really? And they said, yes, really. Uh, and I said, can I get some help from a friend who's written about Callimachus, who's an actual classicist, who's fluent in ancient Greek rather than being like I am. I'm the kind of girl who can read it with a dictionary, but not with that one. And uh, my friend Mark Payne, who's a Callimachus scholar, agreed to help and make sure that all the errors I was introducing were intentional uh, and to write a foreword. And I'm pretty happy with the way that it turned out. Should I read two short poems from the new one? No. Okay. Um, so this is a version of uh, Epigram 24, which I turned into a trans love story with X-Men jokes. And it's about a real life couple and they know who they are. Um, although they're not in here under their real names. Columbicus Epigram 24. The shepherds I know tell stories for one another. And mostly they're not about Daphne escaping Apollo, dramatic natural disasters, or even the broad sails of the bravest Argives. We prefer Scott and Emma, or Gray and Tess, who crossed a continent to be together, having realized that each would follow the other anywhere that they would rather rip up their lives than stay apart, that their loves were real and true and strong, no less so for how long they themselves believed they were more like sisters or brothers. And I guess it ends kind of quietly. I don't know. I hope you like it. No, it's great. Beautiful, yes. We're okay. muted. <laughs> we're just muted. Uh, I swear. Can I, can I, can I use a uh, word you can't use on the radio on this or not? I, I think we should read. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll <laughs> Sorry. I don't, we're not, we're not about censoring. So yeah. <laughs> let's go okay. for it. <laughs> Wait, are we are saying yes? I just, it's open to a yes. poem I've never read before. Uh, and it represents another kind of um, epigram that, that Columbus was able to write. Uh, and I thought maybe this was a good time to read it, especially since it's, another poem about uh, growing up different and growing up queer. Yes, we'd love to hear it. Okay, so this is after Callimachus, epigram four. 
I already know how your friends with the school spirit hoodies are jerks who won't accept me, who mock or spy on me and mine Monday through Friday. Frankly, it's rough. Don't ask me what my fucking mood is. At the end of the school day, don't bother saying goodbye. I'll say goodbye to you. I know what's in your sour heart. You think I'm a joke or a sin. Just shut your friends up, please. That would be more than enough. That's great. Okay. And, uh, it looks like we do have some questions coming in for you. Okay. So from YouTube, how do you begin the writing of a poem? So usually I, well, I used to say, I usually begin with a phrase that I want to use or a set of words that seem to fit together. And that does often happen. Um, these, and that's how most of the poems and advice got started. A uh, couple of words fit together and then I sort of took it from there. Um, and sometimes I finish a poem in a, you know, in a few hours or even you know, 90 minutes and show it to friends and they say, that's perfect. And sometimes it takes you know, eight years. Um, save your drafts. You never know what you're gonna come back to and discover that now you know how to fix a problem. Um, and there's not really a pattern in what poems I finish fast and what poems I finish slowly. Uh, but, but until recently, until really around the time I was finishing advice, I would have said it, it almost always begins with a couple of words together. Um, I want to think of my writing process as collaborative now and more explicitly collaborative than it used to be, especially since I honestly, I have more close friends, both in and out of the professionalized poetry world. And, you know, not, not a small number of the poems that I'm working on or that I finished and published recently. And this has always happened every so often, but it's a much more conscious and frequent part of my writing process for poetry come from commissions, come from a friend saying, you know, I'll give you an assignment if you give me an assignment. Why don't you write about that? Why don't you do this? Um, the, the whole After Callimachus book was partly an assignment. Uh, I had people say, why don't you do a whole book of these? Uh, and a number of the, the poems I'm, I'm working on lately come from people saying, why don't you use this form? Why don't you write about this comic book character? Uh, why don't you use this idea. So poems that are some, it, the process really does begin more often now with someone I care about making a suggestion. And I, I like working that way. Right. Um, um, you're, you're still selecting questions, right? I don't need to go through the chat because you're doing uh, it. We'll, we'll pick them out for you. We'll read them out. Okay. Yeah. Oh, now I'm seeing them. Hi, you can enter questions in the chat. <laughs> Yeah, um, so there, there is one coming from Eugene on Facebook and he's actually more interested about like your career and how it is to be a trans person in Harvard, uh, if, if you know if you're like the first one or not. Uh, yeah, and what well, I'm, I am absolutely not the first trans person at Harvard. Uh, <laughs> I and <hope> so. <laughs> I'm not the only out trans person who is employed by Harvard currently. I may be the only out binary trans person who has a full-time teaching job with Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences. I don't know. Uh, I haven't, you know, called up the, 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 the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology to say uh, <laughs> trans faculty lately. Um, maybe they have. They're certainly wonderful trans biologists. Um, yeah, as, if, if we have other people who are out as binary trans who are some kind of professor in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, I haven't met them yet. And probably somebody's gonna email me tomorrow. Um, and I am visible. Uh, I have colleagues who teach in other departments whose pedagogy and whose scholarship is more about how to be an activist, how to change the legal and the medical systems and the political culture to make them better for people like me. Um, I am adjacent to that, but I don't do it uh, as, as a matter of, of my scholarly and critical work. I write about works of art and I write about the culture I see and I sort of recommend you know, books and comic books um, and, and try to describe them adequately. 
Uh, so, so I, I, that said, I do, I, I hope that I'm, I'm a, a useful mentor when queer and trans students seek me out and I'm certainly in touch with queer and trans and sort of gender non-conforming current and recent Harvard students. And I hope I've been useful for them. Um, if they're watching this, hi, students. I mean, I also hope I'm a useful mentor for, you know, cishet students uh, who sometimes come to my office too, but uh, I do recognize that my visibility enables me to, to play, my visibility and, and frankly, my security enables me to play a role. And I hope I play that role, you know, well. And I do like playing that role with students. Thank you for doing that work. <laughs> Uh, the next question is from Gabriel on YouTube. Your mm -hmm. poems feel very light and free when personifying inanimate objects. I mean mm -hmm. that in a good way, but your themes are more fraught. I wonder how you balance tone, how the light mixes with the heavy. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It's certainly something I try to do, so I'm glad you, you find a balance there. Um, yeah, I try to write about serious things in a way that's uh, you know, not goth uh, and not very metal. Um, and not very gloomy, um, and that has a good deal of, of joy and, and fun in it, even when the jokes are kind of dark or the problems don't have visible solutions. Um, tone is so hard to describe, but I do try to, to keep some lightness in there. And I think I've gotten better at that as I've gotten older because I've been more willing to try to keep the poems conversational, not to go in and replace a common word with a rarer and more evocative word every single time to create a background that's inviting so that the weird words can stand out. And I do think about the resonances of individual words, which ones are fancy, which ones stand out, uh, which ones would be dull on their own. So I think about verbal color a lot, I hope that helps. But that's a great compliment. I'm, I'm glad you find that. Thank you. Uh, so I think that I don't see any more questions from our audience. Um, so we'll ask one and then we'll, since it's almost up, the, the hour's almost up, then we'll just leave that as the last question. Okay. Um, what would you recommend for anyone that's struggling to find their poetic voice? And this is a little bit more of what you were already speaking about. Any tips that you can share to help poets improve their skills? Yes. Um, Three tips, and there's a little bit about this and don't read poetry if you feel like reading a whole book by me, uh, but, but you don't have to do that. Um, one is try to put yourself in a place where you can find peers and people you trust who will read your poetry and be willing to read theirs. And you don't need more than a few people like that, but you need some. And for some people that will mean, right now it's probably gonna be online, but taking a class for others, it's gonna mean uh, using Tumblr and other social media to find peers directly. Um, but find people you trust who you want to share work with in an academic or an anti-academic situation. Um, if you're 17, that could mean other people who are 17. Um, if you're 70, that could mean other people who are 70 or other pe people who are 40, or in some cases, people who are 17, I don't know. Um, in, I probably should have said 19 because mine is, but uh, if you're 70, it may be that the person who's best equipped to read your poems is 19. That has happened in real life. Um, so yeah, find peers. Uh, second piece of advice, translate. Translate, translate, translate. W.H. Auden was extremely skeptical of all formal poetic instruction and tried to make a living as a, a poet and a, a man of letters in his era without teaching from most of his life, without teaching the writing of poetry in colleges. Um, but when he wrote about what his imaginary school for poets would have, one of the things he put in it was translation exercises. You do not have to be fluent in another language to translate from it. You should probably read a little bit of it, uh, but even that is maybe not necessary if you're someone who really doesn't know another language because the goal is taking a found object and making it into a poem in the language that you speak, which for most viewers of this stream, not all, it's gonna be English, uh, making a poem, making something from another language into a poem in English. 
Um, so translate, 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 adapt. That's what Renaissance poets did from French and Latin and uh, other languages. So find peers, translate. And then the last piece of advice is not all poems do the same thing. If you have a sense that all poems are supposed to do one thing and you're upset because the poems you're writing don't do that thing, then maybe expand your sense of what poems can do until it encompasses what you want to do or something you think you are capable of. Some poems are mostly funny. Some poems are mostly word games and word puzzles, although there's an emotional core in there if you look for it. Some poems are mostly cries of raw grief or anger and the artistry only shows up later. I just read a very good Harvard student's uh, chapter on the poetry of Paul Monette, who's best known as a memoirist, but who wrote a terrific book and a half of uh, elegies and, and poems of mourning for his partner and others who died in the 80s uh, during the HIV AIDS crisis. Um, so, you know, raw, rawness is fine. Polish is also fine. Poems have styles and poems have emotional goals and social goals that differ one from another. And it's okay if your goal is not somebody else's goal. Well, thank you for that advice. Uh, I guess before we leave, we just want to thank uh, everybody that helped put this program together, our digital content team, exploration and creativity hey, team. Or... <laughs> I look like I'm in a tent and I'm gonna to try to do something with the actual lighting oh. to avoid that unwanted effect because this is not a reading of advice from uh, a giant purple cloth wrapper. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Sorry. Um, sure, no problem. I was just thinking- Coming, also, coming out experience there. <laughs> our, um, our big read branches and the book clubs that read, all, that read your book, uh, both physically and in virtual scenarios sometimes. And then the Department of Cultural Affairs and National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, Thank and you I guess so much. Thank you so much to the NEA and to the city and to the library system and to all of you, including the Invisible Neil, who is uh, doing tech support on this one. Yes, uh, there was one last request. I don't know if you would indulge us. It's, uh, would you mind closing the, 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 the session by one last reading from Advice from the Lights? I see that's from uh, Erica. Isn't Erica it? Silverman. Thank you, Erica. That was a great request. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if anybody's got any requests, and I'll add that Erica is one of our librarians and she led one of our book clubs for, for the NEA. So she's at the um, Silver Lake Ranch. So. Oh, thank you. Um, Do you have any requests? How about the last, I'll, if, 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 I'm just gonna give it a beat in case someone watching or listening has a request. And then if nobody does, I'll read the last one of the book. Five. For, are you getting a purple streak? Uh, yes. Uh, over my face? Okay, I'm gonna try to eliminate that purple streak because blue streaks can be nice, but purple streaks are only really for hair right now. <laughs> uh, and maybe I should have done a purple streak in my hair, but just didn't prep for that. Are we good now? Yes, we can see you perfectly. Okay. Oh, I'm seeing in the chat stream, no requests, but lots of positive comments and thanks. This has been so much fun. I, I like attention and I, I, I really hope that uh, a lot of the people who are watching me now are getting the attention that, that you want either right now or in the near future. This is the last poem and advice from the lights and it's called white lobelia, which is a kind of flower. And the flower is, it's a common garden flower, at least on the East coast. Uh, I don't know if it's a California flower, I'm sorry for the East Coast centrism of some of this book. Uh, as as a, a former and uh, you know, proud Minnesota person in between stints on the East Coast, I'm very aware of East Coast bias <laughs> and I, I would hate to perpetuate it. White Lobelia, little megaphones. We hang out in the garden center and gossip with the petunias three seasons a year with leaves too small to resemble thumbs or hands or hearts, too soft for any parts of our threadable stems to grow thorns. We prefer to pretend we are horns, cornets 
and alto sax prepared to assemble in studios and sight read any charts. We are, of course, for sale to generous homes. Some of us have become almost over familiar with ornamental cabbage, with the ins and outs of kale. Others have lost our voice in a painstaking effort to justify our existence as a perennial second choice. Like you, we dismiss whatever comes easiest to us and overestimate what looks hard. In our case, that means we admire our neighbors' luxuriant spontaneities and treat the most patient preparers with disregard. We strive for contentment in our hanging baskets once we know we will not touch ground. We tell ourselves and one another that if you listen with sufficient generosity, you will be able to hear our distinctive and natural sound. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dan. That's great. Yes, thank you. Yeah, and thank you for joining us. Um, so we'll stop the live stream and uh, thanks everybody watching. Thank you everybody for watching. Bye. Thank you. Um, and I think that we.